Welcome to another video in this series on advanced orchestration techniques. In this video, we are going to kickstart our conversation on texture. We'll learn how manipulating the different types and number of layers in your arrangements can have a massive impact on the personality of your music. In this video, we're going to start by discussing the four basic types of textures. Before diving a little bit deeper into the first category and learning different strategies for arranging your melodies. So with that, let's get started. First off, we need to talk about what exactly texture is. In orchestration, the word texture refers to the number and types of different layers in your music. For example, melody plus bassline plus chords. In an earlier video, we talked about how separation, focus, and balance can be used to create these structures and give your orchestration a clear sound. However, we never really talked about how to tell which types of layers you should use and when. These are the ideas that we're going to tackle starting with this video. In general, every texture or combination of textures that you can come up with can theoretically be sorted into one of four broad categories. Linear, accompanimental, soundscape, or hybrid. The linear textures focus on different strategies for arranging a single primary layer of music. In other words, the linear textures all have to do with different strategies for arranging a melody. The soundscape textures are the opposite. They forego any primary melody in favor of creating an ambient world of sound. They're meant to evoke more of a mood than any specific thematic idea or melody. The accompanimental textures are the most common and useful textures. They focus on a melody plus accompaniment model of music. Finally, the hybrid textures refer to any strategy for combining any of the previous three textures together, with the most common type being linear and accompanimental. We will eventually tackle each of these four categories. But for now, in this video, we're going to focus on just the linear textures. The first of which is something called the monophonic texture. The monophonic texture is by far the simplest option available for orchestrating melodies. It consists of a single melodic line, and that's it. The single greatest strength for this texture is its simplicity. Because it consists of only a single line, it can be used as either the most intimate texture imaginable, which is a single soloist, or as the single most powerful sound that the orchestra is capable of producing, which is the entire orchestra working together to perform the melody in octaves. In general, this particular texture is a fantastic choice anytime you want to work with a particularly extreme sound. When writing monophonic textures, there are three helpful tips that you want to keep in mind. The most specific one is something that we're going to call the 4-2-1 rule. The concept here is pretty simple. Regardless of how many instruments are playing your texture, there should be a primary octave or register. This register should have the most powerful sound and the largest instrumentation. If you move an octave above or below this primary register, then the size of your instrumentation should drop by half. And if you move an octave further in either direction, then the size should drop by another half. This strategy helps ensure that your texture will maintain a clear and balanced sound. Tip number two is that, as with all linear textures, your single most powerful tool for developing the personality and emotion of your texture is to control which instruments are being used at any given point. In other words, additive and subtractive accentuation are going to be your best friends. Not every instrument in a monophonic texture has to play every single note. They just can't deviate from the established pitch and rhythm notation from the original melody. Each note played must be for the same pitch and duration as the original notes found in the melody. Finally, a common strategy for all textures, 
but especially the monophonic texture, is something that we will call orchestral framing. In this strategy, the largest number of instruments are saved for the very first and last moments of the phrase. This helps give a sense of structure to the phrase, which can be tremendously helpful when working with such a simple texture. Another useful linear texture is something called the heterophonic texture. This is the most complex of the three linear textures. It's a simple melody being doubled by variations of itself. These can be simplified variations, which use only some of the notes found in the original melody, or embellishing variations, which add new notes to the original melody. When it comes to embellishing variations, you essentially have two basic types. A flourishing embellishment, which performs all of the same original notes found in the original melody, articulating them at the same time. However, their rhythmic values are shortened, and new additional notes are added in between. A rhythmic embellishment performs all of the same original notes found in the original melody, articulating them at the same time. However, their rhythmic values may be shortened and additional articulations of the same pitch may be added. Typically, these tend to be straight rhythms, for example, straight eighth notes or straight sixteenth notes, but original and unique rhythmic motifs may be introduced as well. Regardless of which strategy you take, the whole point of a heterophonic texture is to add a bit more color and personality to your melody. It's not capable of the same levels of power or intimacy that a pure monophonic texture can provide, but it can be used to great effect to manipulate the energy and personality in your foreground material. To write a heterophonic texture, just simply start with your original melody and then decide what kind of variations you want to write. Then try adding them one at a time until you've created the sound that you're looking for. When using this texture, it can be helpful to keep in mind two useful tips. The first is that your primary melody must be the strongest and most prominent voice in the texture. Just because they're all based on the same basic idea doesn't mean that you can forget about the three pillars of separation, focus, and balance. The second is that when you assign the variations to different instruments, make sure that you play to their strengths. You don't want to give a fast-paced, flourishing embellishment to a less-than-agile instrument like the bass or tuba. Finally, the last texture that we'll talk about in this video is called the chordal texture. The chordal texture is second only to the monophonic texture in terms of simplicity. It's a single melody being doubled in intervals other than an octave, using strictly chordal tones. This is not the same thing as using melody plus chords. Since the rhythms are identical, it sounds like a single melodic idea. This texture can't provide the same level of power or intimacy as the monophonic texture, nor the abundant color and personality of the heterophonic texture. However, it functions as a perfect middle ground between the two, capable of providing either power or intimacy and color and personality. To write a chordal texture, you'll want to start with a simple melody and chord progression. Then, using an identical rhythm, write one or two supporting lines beneath your original melody, using only chordal tones. Optionally, you can also include a simple bass line underneath it all to help anchor them all together. As with the previous two textures, I do have some tips for this one as well. Once again, additive and subtractive accentuation are your best friends for adding subtlety and nuance to your texture. You want to stick to three voices maximum, just a melody and two support lines, unless you have a good reason to create more. This helps ensure both balance and clarity in your sound, and you shouldn't add any more unless you have a good reason to add them. Finally, you do not have to write the full chord under each note in the melody. You can even create seemingly new chords between the melody and whatever chordal tones you happen to be using in the support voices. The only rule is that you use each essential tone 
at least once before changing chords. And with that, we have reached the end of another video. I hope you found it helpful. I want to take a quick moment to thank my wonderful patrons who make videos like this one possible. This week, a special shout out goes to my newest patron, Mark. I'm grateful for your support. I also want to thank each and every one of you who show your support through the many kind emails, comments, and messages that I receive. It means more to me than you know. If you would like to show your support, there are links in the description below. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Until next time, keep studying, keep working hard, and keep writing new music.